Congratulations. You have reached the Corona DSO. 592 Exchange. Thank you. Today I have a special guest who was on a couple of shows ago, who I still haven't got the previous show up and running uh, after editing it. Graham, otherwise known as Thunder Bass on Instagram and elsewhere. Are you still there, Graham? Yes, sir. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have you back. And so right before we started, you had relayed to me this kind of creepy story that just happened to you this week. So what is this thing that just happened to you? And Let's start with that. Well, I was getting dropped off somewhere at 2 in the morning, and I was just getting out of the vehicle, and I hear someone say, Graham. And I figured, okay, it's probably my neighbor or something, and so I said, what? And he goes, whatever, it's just my last name. Mm-hmm. So I go, yep, yeah. and I look, and this guy's just walking down my street at 2 in the morning, no jacket on. So I go, who are you? And he's about 30 paces ahead now, walking at a good clip, and he goes, come closer and find out. And so I get, I got back in the vehicle, and uh, I told my buddy what just happened, and we sat and watched as that guy kept walking down the street. So when he's walking down the street, out. is he walking towards you down the street, or like further away? He walked past the vehicle. Oh, okay. Like from, we were parked on the side of the road, of the street. And he walked past, and in passing, he said my name to me. And then we got back in the vehicle. And this isn't someone that you recognize. This is just some random, in the dark, at 2 in the morning. Right, right. I didn't recognize him. He said, come closer and find out. So we watched him walk down my road. He went down a back alley. We took about 20 seconds and drove ahead. We went left down the next road, like at the intersection. Okay. And we saw this guy again. He was walking, like, in front of a park. And he had, uh, we made eye contact. And he doesn't, he doesn't know me. I don't know him. But somehow knew your name. Somehow. Yeah. And I mean, granted, as a musician who you played in front of probably a fair number of people, but even so, like, if you're just going to one of your shows, would the people who go to your shows necessarily know your name? No. No. Like, I I don't think so. Some bands will, like, announce who's playing, you know, so-and-so's on bass, go play your solo for a second, and then so-and-so's on the drums, etc., but like, yeah. even so, like yeah, how many people pay attention to that? The music, right? I think, then to like, unless they really dig me or something, and they're like, "Oh, I want to like get to know that guy or something," which <laughs> doesn't happen as often as you would think. <laughs> I mean, or, it, it is possible that he could have been a fan of yours. Then just <laughs> you'd think if he was <laughs> though, that he would have said something it. along those lines, right? That does make me feel a bit at ease. <laughs> maybe I was gonna say, maybe he heard our last podcast together. <laughs> also possible. There's definitely at least one person in Thunder Bay who has listened at least once. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so hopefully uh, that's the last we hear of that particular creepy person, unless they are in fact a fan. 
But if this uh, turns out to be the thing that disappears you, at least the world will know why, right? And they'll know kind of where to start looking. So what did this person look like, this creepy person? They had no jacket on. They had kind of a square jaw. They had uh, like a gym strap type beard. Average height male. Had a Dollarama bag with them. Brown eyes. Dark hair. Like, I don't think he's... Something made me feel like he's probably not from around here originally. Like It's just one of those things where you, you haven't seen him around, you haven't seen him since, that sort of thing. Yeah. Kind of looked out of place. So. Yeah, I mean, look at the place. And then, like, the really odd part is like, I didn't even think to look behind us to see if there was a vehicle. I just we had been having a conversation in the vehicle before I got out for about twenty minutes. So I don't know where this guy even came from. He was just there. Like he could have gotten out of a vehicle or something. Like who knows? Like I'm trying not to overthink it, but yeah, but it's okay to overthink in the when actually like delving into the, the particular scenario. But so th- there was that that happened this week. But there's a couple other things that have been going on. Uh, one might as well mention this at this point because. It is at that point of the year where the U.S. election finally got wrapped up as of this week. And Biden turned out to have the most electoral votes. They are still engaged in lawsuits from one side to the other to try to change the outcome of the U.S. election. But at this point, unless something really surprising happens, it's probable that Biden is going to be the next president of the United States. He is the president-elect. And their system of government, it seems to be clicking forward in terms of giving him the reins of power next. However, different sides and different factions may not want that to happen. It does seem to be happening. And Trump specifically lost support of the Republicans in the Senate and in the Supreme Court seems to have lost. So he's lost basically all of the things he needs to continue to govern. And so that is one of the things that happened this week. Do you have any comment on the goings on on that side? Well, in a perfect world, I'd like to say, may the best man win. But of course, (laughs) we don't live in that perfect world. And I'm sure of the, the or men... Or candidate, I should say, I should, you know, I should include, like, let the best candidate win. I shouldn't just say man win. Yeah, exactly. In this, in this case, there's only two choices. There's two men, so it's like, you know. Yeah, they, their their choices were definitely pretty limited this time around. That is for sure. But so that that's what's been going on in the states. It, here in Canada, COVID has continued to spread, and it has continued to be it continued to be a problem. And specifically in Ontario, local to you, they have ratcheted up the restrictions as of next week. I'm of the understanding. Yes, at twelve oh one a.m. Christmas Eve. We're going into a different stage of lockdown where dining into restaurants is forbidden. Things like that. Like, I'm not sure exactly all it entails. So that's basically what the article said that I read. It's like, huh. See, it's kind of interesting that, like, our provinces are definitely dealing with this differently. Both of them are ratcheting up the restrictions right around Christmas and making life around Christmas a lot more difficult. And But it's interesting here in Saskatchewan, our government seems really in favor of people going out to dine in restaurants. And in fact, like I am not even allowed to visit my parents right now. But if I wanted to visit them at like a local Denny's or a local just general dine in restaurant, that would be okay. <laughs> it's, but I couldn't go to their house. So that would be totally forbidden. Which makes Christmas dinner so much more complicated. And but so as far as going to other people's houses, are there any restrictions along those lines in Ontario right now? I'm not sure, but so just speaking about Christmas kind of reminds me how years ago there was a big, there's a lot of talk in the U.S. about the war on Christmas was like a big hot button issue. And like, I'm wondering where those people are now. Like, Well, especially like, since like, it, it, this it, is basically their wet dream. Like, yeah, exactly. And like that type of rhetoric tended to be more associated with the right side of the political spectrum and, yeah. and using it against the a-religious or more a religious left side back in the previous spin of the culture wars a, g- a generation ago. And yet, here we are. Saskatchewan's a conservative province. Ontario is a conservative province. Uh, we've got the <laughs> U.S. side is still conservative. It's like the entire restriction seems to be fiercest, at least, on the conservative side. So when we have something that approximates a war on Christmas more than anything that has ever come before. The marketing term, to be honest, just so people galvanize I'm not sure what that really does. Speaking of Christmas things and government, though, did you see the article in, I think it was T-Bay Newswatch in Thunder Bay about the nativity scene over there? Oh, some, yeah, there's a stink being raised. No, I don't, I'm not sure what that's all about. Oh, okay. So, so. That there is one? Yeah. Why I, don't they, why don't they put their own there then? Yeah, it sounded like there is a nativity scene at City Hall, if I'm understanding correctly. Um, well, the one that I, I see is uh, up on Red River Road. That's one I've seen. Okay. And like, yeah, what, it's, what, where it's, is it like specifically? 
What's that? Like, well, is it on city property? Is it on, like, a park? It's, yeah, it's on city property. Like, no public property. Yeah, it's like a uh, park. Okay, so so that's that seems to me to be a reasonable place to put a scene like that, right? Especially if you're not doing anything else with that particular patch of land, right? I mean, it'd be one thing if you put it, like, right in the middle of City Hall and everyone kind of has to walk by it to do official city business or something. But just sort of out of the way, even in a main street like a Red River. Well, it's under kind of like a shelter kind of thing. Yeah. What, which so makes sense. Or whatever. But it's got to be but, uh, somewhere yeah. kind of shelter. Right? Yeah. So, but the, the thing is, like, I don't really understand what the stink is. I haven't read the article, but I think it sets a precedent. So if you want to put a bathroom right there, go ahead. Do what you want. Yeah, exactly. Decorated. So when you're saying Red River, is it the one like right by the Waverly Library? That little triangle? Yeah. Little. Uh, yeah. It's like a little. Like you said, there's kind of like a roof, and so you're kind of sheltered from the the elements a little bit there. And it is a public place, but it's also like an area of land that is kind of designed for such things. It's designed for little community events, little displays, little you know people to just hang out there. It's really suitable for such a thing. And this is coming from someone who's like definitely not pro Christianity at all, right? But if that's even from like a musician perspective, nobody likes a stage hog either. Yeah, and it's also within like a throwing distance of what four churches, right? Yeah, <laughs> the, the biggest. They don't have four of them. What's that? At least they don't have four nativity scenes. Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that they don't. <laughs> but the four versions of events from the four different faiths, you know. I mean, I do think it would be fair if, for example, the, the Church of Satan or the equivalent Satanists also put up their little display after Christmas is done or while a Christmas. Goat? Yeah, well, a little goat or something. Hey, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's all relative. Like you say, as long as they're not hogging the stage, right? And as long as it's... Spaghetti monster? Yeah, exactly. Why not? It's a good place for such things. And I'd much rather see that than just in front of the library area. Uh, is There's panhandling, there's uh, drug use, that sort of thing. And if people are investing in actually building and doing something for the community, regardless of what it is, could do more stuff like I know St. Andrews does stuff like outreach for people who are down on their luck this time of the year and like that sort of thing if it encourages people to do it great but like there's definitely on that particular corner things that it could be used for if it if nobody does anything right and it's just a central location so a good place for various projects but anyway so there's that going on this week but you are also back to the, the lockdown though so you can't go to dine in not sure about the visiting people side is there any other restrictions that you know about or that have been i mean other than the ones we talked about last show with the, the live venues and stuff well yeah they're saying like you should stay home that's basically the bottom line. So, like, stay home instead of go out visit family for Christmas? Honestly, I don't know. I'm not very well informed on this new thing, the new stage we're in. No problem. But it's one of those things, too, where the rules keep changing and people are expected to, to keep up with them, right? Like, here in Saskatchewan, I heard that the fines are going up to over $7,000 per ticket, but someone also was saying that it's only 2100 or 2800 and So, I could probably bring up... I've got the tab in front of me, and I could look it up, but they keep changing the rules, here, at least, right? <laughs> and so it's yeah. kind of hard to keep up with them, even if you want to keep up with them, even if you want to understand what you're expected to do, right? Yeah, it's the definition of shifty like things keep moving around <laughs> shifting left and right oh we're more free we're less free like, yeah exactly not free in the good uh Political sense, but and so, just and so like I, I can sympathize with the people who are at least here in this province going out to protest, saying, "Oh, you know, our freedoms are being violated. Uh, we've got all these r rules and restrictions on us." Like I feel for them because everyone's getting affected by the same restrictions, right? But on the flip side, I want to go back to being able to, for example, go out and as a musician get up on stage and perform in front of people, right? I mean, there are other things keeping that from happening in my case, but I'm sure you <laughs> would also feel the same on, on that side, right? Yeah, I can believe that. And so the only way we're going to get back to that is either through vaccines, as we talked about last show, or everyone not going to big house parties, not going to big busy bars and that sort of thing and spreading COVID around. And while you're doing what you're doing, I'm noticing Google Maps still has Ohmbase as listed as being in 
285 Red River Road, which is right in front of this triangle we're talking about. One base, of course, is the hackerspace that closed. Did move into the basement of the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Waverly Branch, but they, as probably mentioned in previous shows, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle there where they invited us in because we took their invite because it was free rent, and then... They wound up trying to take over the space from us and wound up, the whole thing fell apart and got shut down. A lot of stuff got thrown out, including some equipment and very, very messy. Now Thunder Bay doesn't have, or I think it may have a a maker space now, but it doesn't have a hacker space. And well, on a positive note though, there Pinball's making a comeback in Thunder Bay. Pinball, you say? Pinball. Interesting. How is Pinball making a comeback, or at least pre-COVID? Well, pre-COVID, there's a company in Thunder Bay. I'm not sure what they're called, but I'm a big fan of them. Like, just because of the machines. They really take care of these machines. They have some world-class ones. And they have at least 10 of them. And they were all across Thunder Bay. Like, they would swap them from bar to bar. Mm-hmm. So, like, and there was... So, this place. isn't, like, one place with a whole bunch of machines. It's, like, a company that's seeding these bars with the machines and then rotating and maintaining them? Right. Okay. So, here's the thing, though. Because of what's been going on with COVID, now all of these machines are in one arcade. Galaxy Lanes on Arthur Street. Okay. So, and do they have barriers between them, or do they... What are they doing to, like, prevent the machines themselves from being the the COVID vector? Or are they doing anything along those lines? Masks, hand sanitizer. They probably should have shields between them, but they have limited... uh, They limit how many people go in. Okay. So, I think it's four at a time. Just like how dining room, well, I don't know how it's going to be now. It's going to be closed, but like dining room rules where you could have a four people sitting at a table of max. See, it's an interesting idea, though, in terms of wiggling around the rules. Like, especially in a place like Thunder Bay, where up until recently you could go to a dining area, and a place like Saskatchewan, in that up until recently at least you could go to VLTs, right? And the government could very well clamp down on VLTs or clamp down on dining, but are they going to clamp down on pinball like is pinball big enough to be the threat that that transmits covid it may very well just fly right under the radar and be one of those things where you can still do and perhaps even do safely because really it should be possible to rig up a pinball machine to be safe to use because it's a solitary activity you're doing it by yourself you could go play with friends but you could just sit and play with a pinball machine for a couple of hours that's also possible so that's definitely something to think about it i think well we think it's probably gonna get shut down to be honest i'm not sure but like not be surprised but even if they do get shut down it still seems that it's possible that you could design a building around or like rig up a building so that everyone can go in safely find their own pinball terminal and play it. Like, it could be a possible renaissance thing, right? That if we're interested in having this kind of entertainment going forward, it would maybe cost-effective. Who knows? Right. So that's been going on. And the other thing you were bringing up before the show is, again, we're in this Christmas season. So what is going on musically (laughs) around you in this uh, Christmas season? Well, one of my good friends, he's a hell of a drummer. He's working on a cover of Jingle Bells. But he's doing a... He picked that because he has what you call a rhythm file. He's addicted to different rhythms. And he picked Jingle Bells because he can really distort the rhythm. And all I know about about it is that he sent me a screenshot of his laptop where he's charting out different time signatures and different tempos increases and decreases like he's a a maniac he's really talented okay and it's gonna sound nothing like jingle bells it's gonna be really what they call proggy okay very rhythmically complex jingle bells got it yeah did you hear acdc's christmas song I did not, but I'm looking at the the Wikipedia article for Jingle Bells right now, and that one is from, apparently was originally published under, quote, The One Horse Open Sleigh in Autumn of 1857. So that is a a very, very old song. Apparently there exists Edison cylinders for it. So this is uh, definitely the sort of thing that we could bring back in in new and creative ways. So that's kind of a cool thing. Cheap Uh, Trick uh, came up with a song. They changed the lyrics of I Want You to Want Me to uh, I Want You... For Christmas. So, you trick? Okay. So, this part's interesting, though. So, quote, It was first performed by blackface minstrel performer Johnny Pell in Ordway Hall on September 16, 1857. And as I've mentioned on previous shows... Jingle Bells? Yeah, Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells is a, a minstrel show song. It is one of the things that we, like, when we look back on the minstrel shows, and I, I don't know, have, have you ever actually seen a whole minstrel show? 
No, I can't yeah. say they have. Nobody, at least under probably like 50, has. It's one of those genres of art and or music that is like completely disappeared. And not only is it completely disappeared, but there's a taboo on it in the United States and a fair amount in Canada. Not as much in Canada, but it's very, very taboo in the United States because of this very common use of blackface to portray African Americans in sometimes silly and derogatory ways, which is a fact. That's what they did. But when we look back on the genre, that there's a lot to minstrel shows. And something like Jingle Bells is one of those things that we forget came out of that. And we forget was also something that people could enjoy regardless of their color of their skin or their cultural background because it's just a Christmas song, right? I mean, again, from the anti, you know, not pro-Christianity side, there's plenty to not like about Christmas music, but lots of people enjoy Christmas music, right? I don't even think Jingle Bells is like a Christmas song. It's a, it's a winter song. Yeah, it's, it's a winter actually, song, exactly. Yeah. And so there's this one of those just like little strands going into the those minstrel shows that this kind of represents and it's interesting to bring out. Like I kind of liken it to the idea of a rock opera and like the, the especially like the, the when it really like peaked in like the late 80s, early 90s with the big hair, you got Kiss, you had people uh, wearing really bizarre and highly sexualized sometimes costumes. David the, Bowie. What's that? David Bowie. Yeah, David um, Bowie. Like when the um, next generation looks back on that generation, yeah. is it going to make sense at all? Like, <laughs> what are they going to think of those weirdos who did that? But I mean, it was there were there was a lot of awesome music that came out of that. And uh, so it's, it, I think the same sort of thing happened in that case too. And it looks like Jingle Bells is kind of an example of that. You were saying, though, of, uh, so there's the drummer with the Christmas Jingle Bells. What else is going on in terms of uh, that sort of thing? Oh, like, am I doing a Christmas cover this year? Uh, well, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you not doing a Christmas cover? I never really sat down and thought about doing one yet. Okay. I have to find one that doesn't have a bad history. <laughs> So, Jingle Bells, that one's off. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, there are a surprising number to choose from. I know I was listening to some last night or last couple of nights that were like the HP Lovecraft mythos Cthulhu themed, we're all going to go mad and the, the dead will rise and everyone will die and that sort of thing. So it was cute, but it was interesting how they picked obscure Christmas songs to do in that. It wasn't just the Jingle Bells and that sort of thing. There were some that I knew were Christmas songs, but you had to think about it for a moment, right? And so there was that. But you were saying, though, that you are kind of like, you saw, too, what was it, too much Christmas covers being done or, or something along those lines? Well, it's like, it's a bit of a cash in, I think, sometimes. <laughs> Unless you're writing an original like John Lennon would have, or... And there's definitely space right now for an original 2020 Christmas song. Like, people would would lap that up, I think, at this point. There's Everyone's lonely. We're all uh, home alone. <laughs> Lots of us can't see our families. And so there's space, I think, musically for something. I don't know. Hopefully like, something uplifting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Christmas is an uplifting. It's supposed to be kind of like an uplifting time where everyone's going through the same thing. Everyone's cold. Everyone's, you know, it's a very universalizing experience. When we hear the, the tale of the Christmas Carol or whatever with Scrooge and the, the ghosts and all that stuff, everyone understands it. Everyone's going through the same things right now. There's lots of problems with money. There's lots of like social inequality problems. There's all these problems that Christmas brings us together in a way that we aren't usually brought together. And so regardless of whether you buy the Jesus thing, right, it's, it's still a time of year where these things happen. And so there's this space for like looking at social problems and looking at just the fact that we are together, right, and, and appreciating that and, and kind of going from there. But so there's definitely space for something along those lines. But on the flip side, it's definitely also easy and definitely possible to, for especially stores, to like really push like the commercialization side where like you have to buy presents for people and you have to go shopping and you have to spend more than you earn and spend more than you should and get into all this kind of credit card debt because it's socially acceptable, right? And Christmas carols are, I kind of imagine Christmas carols playing in the background with that process going on as a way to like even encourage you to get into the spirit, right? And uh, so that's going on. 
So, to that effect, just as an aside, somebody pointed out this week that they thought that all of my shows, all of this this show, this All Hell Can't Stop Us, that a lot of my guests recently have been online, as, as you currently are. And the goal of this show <laughs> was not to have that happening. That is an artifact of COVID. That I would love to go to Thunder Bay and to record an episode there. Maybe someday, again, in the future, that'll happen. But Yeah, we can do some video down here, too, if you want. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And so with that in mind, uh, so how else has COVID been affecting you over there in this Christmas season? Well, pretty smooth sailing. I, I have no symptoms. Um, my circle's been healthy. So so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. I feel like we're going in the right direction as a circle. I don't know about as a whole, like the greater Thunder Bay area. I don't know. Okay. If you want, apparently Ontario's not doing so well as a whole. So, But like a, a lot of that is going to be Toronto though, right? Like, and there's a big difference between Toronto and northwestern Ontario. All, all you like hear that. stories about people who are in places that are locked down, but they go to a different town that is not locked down to do their Christmas shopping. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> no kidding. Very bizarre. So, of course, COVID is not the only thing going on along those lines. Down on the state side, and I sent you the link. I do want to mention this before we get too far late into the show. There's been a couple of movements to regulate cryptocurrency. And so as a cryptocurrency user, this would, if I were an American, affect me. But it's one of those things where like once the Americans pass it, they're probably going to push it on the rest of the world. And so I've got an Action Network Fight for the Future petition here that's talking about how the U.S. Treasury intends to ban, quote, anonymous self-hosted wallets, a critical component of any decentralized cryptocurrency network. So basically what they're talking about getting rid of is the ability to run the software to use Bitcoin on your own equipment. So you'll be legally able to use Bitcoin to do things like pay for a show if you can find a show or a venue that will accept your Bitcoin or get paid with it, etc., etc. But the only way you'll be able to do that is through big monopoly-like companies that have positioned them themselves as the kind of de facto equivalent of credit cards in the cryptocurrency space. Whereas um, it's the whole point of cryptocurrency is that it's just software. And so anyone should be able to just like download it, install it and use it without anyone's permission. And so they're trying to like squeak themselves into the between the user and the software that the user run. And the only way they're going to be able to do this is by controlling what software people run on their computers. So there's that going on. And at the same time, so what, what, we, what, we, what we were touching on last time, a little bit, how it's like, okay, the people who maybe started social networks, like social media, maybe they had good intentions, but it's like the people who are going to take it over once they're gone. Right. You know, that's like, that's an atom bomb. Like, we didn't, like, you know, we shouldn't have done it, but we did. Hey. Some, somebody was going to. And that's so, that's kind of a risk with cryptocurrency generally, right? Like, Satoshi Nakamoto, he gave the world this thing that allowed us to have control over the the finances in our life at a, a level that a lot of people aren't really even cognizant is possible. And yet, with him gone, and with the original people who developed it slowly losing interest and finding other things to do with their lives, or just getting wealthy and not having anything to do with it anymore. Like, unless you have that level of engagement, keeping the system honest, there are going to be bad actors that are going to come in and force it to be something closer than uh, to a Big Brother 1984-esque machine for tracking people. And Bitcoin is fully capable of doing that if people don't use it properly. So so there's that going on as well. Um, Go ahead. Is this, uh, do you see things are kind of all going like, coincidentally like towards one step like having things very homogenized like that might not be the word for it having things very um, like monopolized basically for sure and it's there's only so many choices for being able to for example we were talking a little bit before the show about skip the dishes and how once a whole city uses and is used to ordering food using one single app, it's hard to undo that. It's hard to get people to think that, oh, hey, it's possible that you can actually have your own delivery driver. And And compete. And compete, yeah. And it's because now with Skip the Dishes having so much market share, and same thing with MasterCard, same thing with Visa, it's hard to imagine that at one point they were just small companies and they had to grow to the scale that they they are now currently at. And if you started a new MasterCard or a new Visa or something like that, mm-hmm. like nobody would want to use it because you'd be competing against these giants. 
And so right now there's this little glimmer of the possibility that you could build something without the permission of Visa, without the permission of MasterCard or Square. And you didn't have to go to the big banks to be funded to do this. You could just build it. And if it works, it works. But we're constantly at risk of that era <laughs> ending, especially with this sort of thing going on. And uh, yeah, there is one other thing. I'm just going to see if I can find... Oh, here we are. It's an article by Vice about, quote, students are rebelling against eye track exam surveillance tools. And it's the same kind of thing where, like, there's only so many companies that are offering anti-cheat software, and they're kind of buying the other companies out, et cetera. And it's getting to the point where like, there's so widely accepted that the technology in your life is it's okay for it to be spying on you that they're pushing to actually make it not allowable for students, at least, to use regular desktop computers. Because regular desktop computers don't have this spyware, or at least their spyware, built into it. And so... This article might be a red herring. Yeah? Yeah, in a sense. Because even if you use, like, a filter, an innocent filter, like, it w some of them do track where your eyes are going. Like, you can wink and, like, move your eyes around. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, like, it's kind of like when the FBI said, well, Apple's not going to give us the back door to the iPhone, where it's right. like... But even, like, a tech-savvy kid in high school could figure that out. Well, or at least the more advanced cracking labs, things like the hacking team, there were exploits for the iPhone that were on the market at that time. And, I mean, the their claiming not to be able to get into those phones was sketchy at best, even when they were making that claim. But uh, yeah, so this might be a, a similar thing. I have a, a gut feeling. And there's certainly, like, like th for example, all of the students that the, this Vice article and in general are going to be talking about are going to be using Windows. And Windows itself does have spyware built in, and it's available for at least the U.S. government and people with the ability to compromise Windows. But your university won't necessarily have access to this, and your your neighborhood university security guard won't necessarily have access to this. But they might have access to this Proctorio, and they may with Proctorio, this company, be having the layer of control over your computing environment. They can also prevent you from running other things, like the wrong kind of compiler, the wrong kind of analysis tools for your own understanding of what's going on in your own computer. And so I did just want to go into that a little bit, but we are getting close to the end of the show. So is there any last words that you'd like to tell the world now that you've got the world's attention? Well, have a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and whatever your guys' family traditions are, have a safe one. Excellent. And just as a reminder for those of you out there that there is a subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff to support this show specifically. And Graham has Instagram Thunderbase. Uh, that's thunder.bass base instrument. So, do you have anything I can quickly go out on? I think. No, nothing is sticking out here. So, I'll end for the week, and I will see you all next week. And thanks again, Graham, for taking part this week. Oh, thanks for having me again. And we'll see you all next week.